Today, I have a triple whammy for you, a monthly wrap up, a tag, and an important announcement. This is Bookish Islander, my name is Juan. I hope you're doing very well. Okay, so somehow, after many strange weeks, we seem to have made it to May. So I thought I would go over all the books I finished reading in April and talk about them and tell you what I thought about them, okay? Then after that, I'll do a fun little tag. And finally, there's an important announcement about my channel, Bookish Islander, that I'd like to share with you all. If you're new to my channel, I put out weekly videos every Saturday in which I talk about books. All the videos are subtitled. That's my way of making them more accessible to people. If you like, you can activate the subtitles by pressing the CC button right now or at any time, okay? So let's start with the reading wrap up. Last month, I read several novels. Let's begin with the first one. I read The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, which is the debut novel by Michael Chabon and first came out in 1988, okay? I had read this novel before, but I didn't remember much about it or actually didn't remember anything about it. So I decided to read it again. When it comes to debut novels, I've developed the following expectation. In my experience, okay, maybe different for you, but in my experience, most debut novels by contemporary writers tend to be vessels for everything the writer wants to tell. And that means that first novels tend to be overambitious. And often writers then work out what they want to say in later, better novels. Often they want to say it all in the first novels, like they've been working on it all their lives, okay? But I didn't feel that at all with Mysteries of Pittsburgh. Reading it, I thought Shabon was a writer who was in control of his material. In fact, if I didn't know that this was his first novel, I wouldn't have guessed it. The Mysteries of Pittsburgh is a coming of age story that charts one summer in the life of a young man, Art Bextein. It's the summer right after his college graduation. So who is this guy? Okay, Art is the son of a money laundering mobster who wants to reassert his own personality and with that distance himself from his dad and his illicit business. Art becomes an adult during that summer of sexual discovery. And I thought, you know, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh is definitely an ambitious novel. It's probably far from being Shabon's best work of fiction, but it is a remarkable first novel nonetheless. I'd like to delve deeper into the work of Michael Shabon, so let me know what books by him you recommend in the comment section down below, please. I'd really appreciate that. The Mysteries of uh, Pittsburgh, it's true, has some comic elements, you know, there are some moments where I laugh, but the next book I read last month is essentially a work of humor. Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome is a short novel published in 1889, so almost 100 years before The Mysteries of Pittsburgh. In this novel, three male friends decide to undertake a boat trip up the River Thames in England. This was one of the classics I wanted to read in 2020. I made a video a while ago about all the classics I wanted to read before the end of the year. And you can check that out after you're done watching this video, please. So stay with me and then go check that out if you haven't already. Okay, so what did I think of Three Men in a Boat? I think it's the kind of book that you either love, it will either make you laugh out loud and you would love it for the rest of your life, or it would leave you feeling totally cold. I chose it because I thought some levity would be what the doctor ordered, but when I was about halfway through it, I remembered that comic writing has never worked for me or on me. In fact, if contemporary American comic writing by the likes of David Sedaris doesn't usually work for me, I don't know what made me think that a 19th century English novel would. But there you go. Okay, don't click away because the rest of the books um, I read last month I thought were absolutely great and I would like to recommend them to you so stick around. Okay, the next book is Pereira Mantains, which is a novel by the late Italian author Antonio Tabucchi that came out in the 1990s at some point, but it is actually set in Portugal during the 1930, uh, the 1930s. Okay, this novel blew my mind. In it, we follow the main character's gradual discovery of the horrors of fascism. So in the beginning, Pereira, who works as a cultural journalist in Lisbon, seems completely oblivious of what is going on around him. He's almost like someone who's been sleepwalking through life. 
he's a widower and he suffers from some ailments, but I think um, all of it are just symptoms of his apathy. That all changes one day when a young man called Monteiro Rossi comes into his life. Just great. It's one of the best novels I have read in a long time. In fact, I recommended this book on a recent video as well, and it was the video I made about being a polyglot, okay? Another book originally written in Italian uh, that I read is In Other Words by Jhumpa Lahiri. Lahiri is an American writer who learned Italian as an adult and then became an Italian writer. In other words, it's her memoir. It's a short book in which she explains how and why she learned Italian. And it also includes some of the first short fiction she ever wrote in Italian as part, I guess, of her um, language learning process. And the last Italian book I have for you today is Silk by Antonio Barico. This is a short novel set in the 19th century where a French villager becomes involved in the production of silk and has to travel to Japan, which was a country that had become open to the rest of the world for the first time in its history back then. A little gem. Okay, some contemporary American fiction now, okay? Enough of European books. Um, Housekeeping is the debut novel by Marilyn Robinson. If you have followed my channel for some time now and watched my videos closely, you might have already worked out that Robinson is one of my favorite writers. In fact, I think, you know, that she is simply the best American author writing today. My favorite novel by her is probably Gilead, which was her second book, uh, her second novel after Housekeeping. I'd already read Housekeeping, but I'd only read it once. I read all her other novels several times, so I thought it was high time I revisited Housekeeping. And I'm so excited that her newest novel, Jack, is due to come out this year. But anyway, let's go back to Housekeeping. Housekeeping is different from Gilead in almost every imaginable way, except for the fact that they are both novels by the same author, okay? Those are the only similarities. Marilyn Robinson wrote Housekeeping almost 25 years before writing Gilead, so there's a 25-year gap between her first and her second novels. Okay, the main characters in Housekeeping are two orphan sisters, Lucille and Ruth Stone. The setting is the small town of Fishbone in Idaho. The book is slow prose, pregnant with metaphors of the best quality. Robinson has talked about how she was influenced by studying uh, 19th century American writers like Emerson in college. And I think that in Housekeeping, she establishes that connection with her literary ancestors in the 19th century and she's managed to sustain that connection in her later work too. I know that I'll keep going back to her fiction over and over for the rest of my life and uh, I just love it. But anyway, another of my favorite writers is José Saramago who wrote the last book I finished last month, The Double. One of my ongoing reading projects is reading all the books by the only Portuguese um, writer who has ever won the Nobel Prize for Literature, but I'm not doing that in order. I started off by rereading everything I had already read of his, and now I'm reading the rest of his literary production, the books that I have never read, but I'm reading them as the mood takes me. So The Double, which in Portuguese is O Homem Duplicado, is the story of an ordinary high school history teacher who one day one day discovers that there is someone else who looks exactly like him but the similarities between the two men are a lot more than just physical and superficial. I would say that Saramago takes his time building up to the eventual encounter between the two men and you know as with many of his other later novels the double can be read in two ways. It can be read as a straightforward narrative kickstart by an unusual or shocking event or something a lot deeper, something like a commentary on the human condition, really. The Double is far from being one of my favorite novels by Saramago, but I still loved it. Okay, that's my wrap up. If you wanna buy any of these books, please consider using my book depository link. I am an affiliate, 
And what that means is that if you buy from the book depository using the link on my video, on the video description box, and you can buy anything, not just the book I recommend, I shall get a small commission. And that would be a nice way for you to support my channel that won't cost you anything extra. Also, I recommend the book depository because they send books worldwide with no delivery fees. That's why I buy all my books online from them. Okay, if you're still around, next comes the tag I promised you at the beginning. The tag is called the World Book Day Tag. The World Book Day Tag. In case you don't know, you probably know this, but in case you don't know, April 23rd is World Book Day. And I am sorry I'm more than a week late with this tag. I should have done it then, but this was the earliest opportunity I had since Sean the Book Maniac. Uh, tagged me. If you want to see Sean's video, and I recommend you do because his answers are great, there is a link to it in the description box down below. Okay, let's go to the prompts now. First prompt is, what country do you currently call home? Is it the same country where you were born? Okay, I currently live in the Canary Islands. I was born and raised here, but I also lived in England for over 15 years in a row as an adult. I've been back here in the Canaries since late 2016, so I'm not sure if I call the Canary Islands home yet. And I'm definitely open to uh, life somewhere else. Okay, prompt number two. How many countries have you visited? Did you buy books there? I think I've visited eight countries in total so far. France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Wales, England, Spain, Portugal, and the United States. But from memory, I think I've only ever bought books in England, Wales, and Portugal. Although I've bought books online also from the US, from Spain, France, and once even from Venezuela of all places that I can think of. Okay, prompt number three. How well is the world represented in your book collection? Okay, I read in English, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in French, in Catalan, and in Italian, six languages. I own books in all those six languages, plus a few translated books from German and other probably other languages, but not many. Why? Because I can read in six languages, so I try not to read in translation if I can help it, but sometimes I have to because otherwise I would miss out on great books. But I do mostly stay within the literary traditions written in the languages I can read. Prompt number four is how many works in translation do you have currently? Note, not including canon. Actually, not many, uh, and I'm not going to count them, so there you go. Prompt number five tell us some weird facts about your country. Well, there are so many weird facts about my country. Where do I begin? Okay, I think the single weirdest fact about the Canary Islands is that our national anthem is based on a traditional lullaby. You heard that right. And it's true. You can Google it. <laughs> I think that's pretty unique. And I also think it sucks. Prompt number six. Is there a work of word literature on your TBR? There are many. As I said earlier, I'm currently making my way through the work of Portuguese writer José Saramago. Also, I mean to read In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust, so that's a French collection of books this year. And I would also like to explore Brazilian and Italian literature. So, prompt number seven, tag other booktubers, but none from your own country. Okay, this is going to be easy because I don't know any booktubers here in the Canary Islands. So, anybody watching this, uh, feel free to do this tag if you'd like. Also, if you don't have a channel, feel free to answer any or all the prompts in the comment section down below. I would love to hear your answers. Okay, so that's the tag. And now, the announcement. Okay, recently, I've been wondering if making these videos was worth it. I'm gonna get serious for a second, but not just serious, don't worry. Okay, a couple of weeks ago, I even considered stopping making videos and shutting down my channel altogether. But that's not the announcement, okay? After that initial impulse, I did some soul searching and decided that making videos is something I enjoy a lot and I would miss it if I ever stopped. Also, I feel like I have something to contribute, probably something very small to contribute when it comes to talking about books here on YouTube. So. I thought about the source of my recent low spirits and I realized that what I like is to make videos in which I can talk more in depth 
about books, not just a few seconds, but more in depth. One of the things I learned from being a judge for round one of the book to price is that I don't enjoy being forced to read books I don't want to read. I did talk about this um, on my wrap up last month, uh, March 2020. So if you want more details about how I feel about it, go check that out. I want to be in control of my reading and also I want to be in control of the kind of videos I make. And I'm not saying that anyone has ever imposed what videos I make or what, what books I talk about here on my channel, but it is easy, it is so easy to get carried away by hype and try to make the kind of videos that other people make without even thinking whether they are the kind of videos that I want to be making, you know? And with the current health and economic, social economic crisis that we're going through, it is hard to feel like we're in control of anything. At least that's how I feel. So, you know, I'm not willing to let go of what little I can feel in control of in my life. And one of the few things that are under my control is my reading and my YouTube channel. Okay, but what is the announcement? What does that mean to you? Okay, my channel is uh, going to change gradually over the next few weeks. How? Okay, you'd have to stick around to find out. It's not like I don't want to tell you, it's that I'm still working out the details. So, you know, you'll have to wait. But what I'll say is that if you like my videos, if you like the videos that I've put out uh, so far, I think you'll continue to like my content. My channel, Bookish Islander, is still going to be about literary fiction. That's not going to change. But the format of the videos will change and the content will become more in-depth. That's my hope. I'm also thinking of ways in which I can make this experience more inclusive and interactive for you guys. I don't know yet how that will be and we'll see how that goes. These changes are all going to be gradual, okay? So you might not even notice them. And definitely I just hope that you like what's coming your way in the next little while. Oh, and I'll continue to publish my videos every Saturday because I think that works best for everyone. It works really well for me and I think it works for you. Of course, you know, you don't have to watch them on Saturday. If you subscribe and activate the notifications, you won't miss any of my videos. You don't have to watch them on Saturday at all. One of the best things um, about having uh, this channel is the interaction with you guys in the comment section whenever you comment, whenever, okay? I always try to respond. So I hope I can continue to make good videos that would foster great conversations about great books. That's what I wanna do. That, that's all. That's a big announcement, okay? And that's also all for now, okay? Thanks for watching. I hope to see you again very soon. Bye for now.